that's true, friends, then this Bible's not true. And I, I prefer to believe the Bible than what I might think about a situation or a circumstance. Any, any other Bible believers here today? I mean, this one's going to stretch your faith, all right? But I, I believe we can bring it out from God's Word, what we're talking about. So let's go to John chapter 20. We're going to read 1 to 8. It may come on the screen. I'm not sure whether... Yeah, we did. Okay. All right. Now, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. She ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, said to them, they've taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they laid him. So they're thinking he's been stolen. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together and the other disciple, as John, outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And stooping down, looking, and he saw the linen cloth, that's a grave clothes, lying there. Well, that's a bit odd, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, if he's been stolen, what are they doing there? And the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded together in a place by itself, like, <laughs> what's going on here? So, the, you know, the, it's, it's folded away nice and neatly, somewhere different, like, wow, that must have been really confusing, eh, when they saw that. And then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went and also... And he saw and believed. Most people don't talk about grave clothes, but John is an exception to that. At, the first, at first, the burial garments of Jesus looked like a tragedy. The body's gone. Someone's stolen it. What's happened? Where, where is our master? Where is our savior? Where, where is he? And that would have been so, wow, disappointed and shocked. At first, but on that first Easter Sunday, a few days after the death on the cross, God took the clothes of death, the garments of burial, and made them a symbol of victory because the clothes still in the tomb meant that Jesus had not been stolen, but he had risen from the dead as he said that he would. Tragedy becomes a triumph. Now, the triumph I want to talk about for you may not come in the form that you may expect it to come, but come it will. Because somehow God is the master of taking trials and difficulties in our lives and working incredible good. They are actually the seedbed of great fruitfulness in your life. If you will follow the principles of God, God can turn it around because John... 1224 says, most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. That's something bad in your life. But if it dies, that seed goes into the ground, it produces much grain. And so, you know, Jesus, John didn't know what we know. He didn't know that uh, this Friday's tragedy would become Sunday's triumph, that Jesus would, ri be, would rise from the dead because death could not hold him down. And I want to say to you today, no death, no difficulty, no disaster, no tragedy can hold you down because the resurrection power of Jesus can lift you up from the, from the grave clothes of disaster and defeat and difficulty and do something amazing in your life. It's not only they could not hold Jesus down, they can't hold you down, buddy. They can't hold me down because in me is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. The same resurrection power is in every person here. So no matter what has died in your life, no matter what has happened, God can raise you up and work a great triumph and victory in your life. Tell the person next to you, there's resurrection power in you. <laughs> there really is. So, Friday, he's crucified. Sunday, he's resurrected. Friday, you face a defeat. A Sunday, you get your victory. So, here's the question. What did John do on Saturday? Between Friday's tragedy and Sunday's triumph. The Bible doesn't know, but it doesn't tell us what he did. All we know is that on Saturday, he was still around. On Sunday, he was still around. We know, we know that because we just read about it. Now, he had every reason to disappear. If I was him, I probably would have 
He was a follower of the man who just got crucified. <laughs> See, he's probably next on the list. So if I was John, I would have been gone. Hide somewhere, some, something. But we know he didn't do that. So why didn't he do it? Why did he hang around? I want to suggest to you the reason he hang around was that Jesus, to him, was not just a leader, not someone who just blessed him, answered his prayers, was a teacher who worked miracles. No, Jesus was his friend. And when trouble comes to your friend, you don't desert your friend. You hang around. You stay with your friends. You stay with the person that you love no matter what is going on. And that's exactly what we see that John, John did. And because he hung around on Saturday, he saw the triumph on Sunday. You see, he must have been devastated. He must have been confused, disappointed. God, what's going on here? The cross, the death, the tragedy. He thought, Lord, what is this? He was hurting, friends. He must have been hurting. All his expectations were shattered at that moment. Still, he stayed close to Jesus. So what about you and me? When we don't understand what's going on, we're hurting, we're struggling, we're disappointed, we feel that God has let us down, our prayer has not been answered. Our breakthrough has not, been, not come and others for them it has come. When it's Saturday in your life and you're confused and, and broken and disappointed, what do you do on Saturday? Do you still hang around and stay close to Jesus? Or do you think, if, if God, if this is the way you're going to treat me, if this is what you're going to allow to happen in my life, I am out of here. I am no longer going to follow you. I'm no longer going to love you. Friends, when it's Saturday in your life, if you want to see the triumph on Sunday, you've got to stay close to Jesus on Saturday. You see, John wasn't in it just for what Jesus would do for him. And friends, we've got to get past. It's not all about the Santa Claus who's just going to bless us and answer all our prayers and do everything we want. Friends, it's not so much what God can do for us. We need to shift, I believe, our focus to what we can do for God. Yeah what we can do for Jesus. He's done everything ever that he needs to do for you. If he never blessed you one more time, never answered another prayer, he's done enough for you to praise him forever and ever and ever because you're not going to spend eternity in hell, but in heaven. Is anyone glad to be saved? Who reckons that's worth shouting about, praising God about, worshiping your king about? You know, it's almost, I know I'm pushing it a bit hard here, but it's almost arrogance to say, well, if God's not going to do anything for me, what? Yeah. No, he's done everything for you. Yeah. Listen, he died for you. Right. Who have you died for? Well, obviously no one, you're still here. <laughs> Who have you died for? Who have you given your all and everything for? It's not just one man giving himself for another man. This is God. I don't think we get it. I don't think I get it. This is God giving his life, dying for you. Yeah. And then we sort of say, well, God, if you don't do something more, I'm gone. Yeah. Wow. Let's not go there, friends. Because if we go there, if we disappear on Saturday, we don't see the triumph of Sunday. We miss the victory that God has got in store for us. I've been watching the church for 40 years. I'm now 41. <laughs> Why are you all laughing? <laughs> so rude. Sheesh. What was I talking about? <laughs> oh, you've been watching the church for 40 years. <laughs> because that's what happens when people are rude to you. You lose your train of thought. <laughs> Come on. I've been watching the church for 40 years. You know what I've seen? Too many Christians leave Jesus on Saturday. They're gone. New Zealand is full of backslidden Christians who hit Saturday and said, I'm out of here. The sad thing is unless they come back, they will never experience the triumph of Sunday. And they're just going to be such a loss for them and a loss for their eternity, obviously, if they do not come back to him. 
We've created this consumer church of what can God do for me instead of a contributing church which says, what can I do for God? If you can make that shift, it will change your life forever. Do you know why? You have to die to live. So to get the riches of God, you have to die. You have to lose your own life for God so that you can find your life. You've got to sow into God if you're going to reap the blessings of God. And so you've got to pour in. So there's got to come a shift. And you've got to come to church on a Sunday and say, I'm not a consumer. So what's this church going to do for me? I mean, how good is the singing going to be today? Is the preacher going to be any good? Is that going to look after my kids properly? You know, or what's the youth like here? You know, oh, that life group I went to, oh, it wasn't that much. No, folks. It's not what the church can do for you. The church will do everything for you. We'll do our best. If you change and shift to what can I do for the church, heaven will open. Heaven will open. The blessing of God will come upon your life because that's the way it works, friends. You know, some of us have kids. Well, my daughter was fantastic. But some of you have kids, and it's, you know, gimme, gimme, gimme. My name is Jimmy. <laughs> no, no, no. What's your attitude to, to Jimmy? He says, gimme, gimme. No. And then you say, Jimmy, how about you contribute something? How about you do something? How, how, about, how about you wash a couple of dishes or dry a dish or <laughs> sweep the floor? I mean, I don't know if you can ever get kids to do that these days. But anyway, it's worth a try. But you want them to contribute. We want people to contribute, and God wants us to contribute. Anyway, that's another, another message. Let's move on. So the burial garments were still in the original state, understood. I mean, how could that be? There's a huge message in these burial clothes. See, if friends or an enemy had taken the body, they would have taken the clothes with them, would they not? Yeah. Even if they unwrapped the belt body, they're not going to neatly fold all their clothes away like I do every day with my clothes once they're right. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. (laughs) Curry tonight. (laughs) All right, moving along. If they'd unwrapped their body, they would not have bothered to make the grave clothes all nice and neat and tidy. The truth is, no one had taken the body. Jesus had been raised from the dead, and he can leave the grave clothes however he likes, in perfect condition. He had risen, and it says, and John saw, and he believed. So, watch this. When John saw the burial garments, they became a symbol of life and triumph and victory. God can take burial garments, disasters, and make them a symbol of triumph and victory in your life. Let me share with you, not, not, maybe not a, as level of a disaster that some of you face, but you know my story about my dad, a Hindu, 59 years old, he goes to the doctor, he's given three weeks to live, he's got a terminal condition. And so he's facing a, a tragedy for himself, and for me it felt like that as well, because he's heading for an eternity in, in, a, in hell, unless something happens. And so as a new believer, I was really desperate so Adrian, myself, and many others, we fasted and prayed like crazy. And as you know the story, he gave his life to, to Christ. So I, can, I want to share with you four ways in which God turned that tragedy into a triumph. Number one, <laughs> yeah, sure, he's gone three weeks to live, but he got saved. Amen. That was worth it. I mean, God can do it however he likes, but that was a great triumph. Secondly, I learned to pray like never before and to fast like never before. And now that's the key to my life, my ministry to Church Unlimited and New Zealand and beyond. What you saw at New Zealand and beyond and the prayer and fasting that went before it, friends, to some measure, not entirely, you can trace that back to my dad getting a terminal condition and I learned to fast and pray because then we've all developed that skill, or many of us in our lives, and we're seeing God doing extraordinary exponential things. The third triumph that came is it put a faith in my spirit that no one but no one but no one is beyond the power of the gospel to win for salvation. That family member you think is never going to get saved, that neighbor, that boss, that worker, that, that, that student you think is never going to come to Christ, think again. 
the resurrection of Jesus Christ can win any lost person to salvation and a great eternity. That was another triumph, but maybe the best triumph of all, apart from my dad getting saved, but maybe even better than that is that it gave me a passion for souls. And since that time, friends, I have seen literally thousands and thousands of people give their lives to Jesus Christ. You can trace it back to that tragedy that God turned into a triumph. And I reckon the devil wishes like crazy that my dad had never got that terminal condition because he's losing so many souls from his clutches who are now on their way to heaven because of the triumph God worked through that tragedy. Try and get it in your spirit, friends, what God is able to do for you. So the children of Israel, at a dead end between the Egyptian army and the Red Sea, certain defeat. But the Red Sea becomes a symbol of what? Of God making a way where there seems to be no way. Yeah, that's right. How many of you have ever prayed that? I've prayed the numbers on God. I, I can't see any way through that. And then I, God says, remember the Red Sea? I said, yeah, you made a way when it looked impossible. Thank you, Jesus. Would you do that for me? And he's done it for me. Becomes a, what about David? You know, his tragedy, he's running for his life. He's in caves. He's acting like a madman. He's being persecuted. But he ends up Israel's greatest king. So when you're running for your life, when you're in a cave, when you're in a dungeon, when it's dark, when you feel persecuted, that becomes a symbol of God preparing his man or woman to be used by him. Yes. Tragedy into triumph. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, another tragedy, thrown into the fiery furnace, ended up seven times. So bad that those throwing him in died. Have you read the story? You should have, because it was in soul food. <laughs> they died. I mean, that's how hot it is. I guarantee for, forever, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego never worried about God's protection. Yeah. Right? And then they were, not only that, they were promoted in the kingdom of God. So the fiery furnace becomes a symbol of protection and of promotion in God. Yeah. Tragedy to dry. We could go on for many more stories, but I haven't got any more to tell you, so I'll have to move on to something else. <laughs> but isn't it true that our greatest encouragement, faith, in times of great trial come from those in the Bible who suffered the most? Isn't that true? Those who face the tragedies. Those who face the disasters. So we always look to David, don't we? We always look to Moses, 40 years in the burning bush. We always look to Joseph in a pit and a prison. The seed, friends, went into the ground and died. Thousands of years later, is still bearing much fruit in your life and my life for the glory of God. Tragedy to triumph. That's the message of Easter Sunday. That's the message of the res resurrection. So could God do something like that for you? Could he take what today is a token of defeat and turn it into a triumph and a victory for you? I believe he can. I believe that's what the word of God teaches. You just got to make sure you hang around on Saturday. Dr. Criswell, the pastor, tells this incredible story. Well, I think it's incredible. So he's visiting some members in his church, and it was an area where they'd found oil on the land. So he's driving up the driveway. And he sees these oil wells pumping away on this property and that property and that property. And, but there's none on the property of the people in his, I think they were in his church. And so he gets to the door and the wife, wife comes to the front. She's just so depressed and so dejected. And she said, God's forgotten us. God's left us out. Everyone around us is getting this blessing, that blessing. Do you ever feel that way? All right? Look at everyone else. I even do that. I look at some others. I think, man, you, how come God's blessing you more than he's blessing me? We feel disappointed. We feel let down. And so they, were, they, they just had thought that, you know, somewhere along the line, everyone else, they got oil on all the properties around them, but not one drop on their land. They said, the neighbors are moving into the city, and we're left here alone. Seemed like everyone else was blessed, and they were missed out. A few years later, Dr. Criswell goes and Sees the family again. Her husband comes to the door and he's got a big smile on his face. He's happy as anything. And he said, he thinks, they must have found oil. He said, no. He said, they never found any oil on our property. So he's Chris, confused. What's going on? He said, all the people who found oil became very rich. They moved into the city. They brought flash cars, flash houses, put their kids in the best schools. And then slowly, one by one, the marriages fell apart. The kids rebelled from God. And not one of them was still in church at this time. And this man said, we thank God that they never found oil on our land. Because today, me and my wife love each other more than we've ever loved each other. 
assume their kids were still on track, they were still in church, and they were just so thankful to God. What's the lesson, friends? Tragedy, no oil. What's your tragedy? What's your disappointment? Yeah, very good. What is it? Come on, name it in your mind. Name it now. Because God can turn it to a triumph. Just hang around on Saturday and wait and watch what God will do. You may have to wait for a number of Sundays, by the way. But if you wait, this book cannot lie. He works all things together for good for those who love God. So try this. Remove the word everything. God works everything for good and replace it with the symbol of your trial. So for the apostle John, it reads, in burial garments, God works for the good for those, for those who love him. How would Romans 8.28 read in your life? In sickness, God works for the good of those who love him. In failure and mistakes, God works for the good of those who love him. In disappointment, in backslidden children, in loss, in sickness, you name it. Being fired from your job, what would it be? What is it for you? That thing that you wish had never happened. My Bible said, God can work it for good and turn that tragedy into triumph. You may just be one Saturday away from a resurrection. God loves you just as much as he loves John, the Apostle John. He loves you as much as he loves anyone else in this room, even as much as he loves me. Well, maybe not quite, but close. Remember the second half of this passage. Now, this is key. Listen carefully. God works for the good of those who love him. Yeah, right. Very good. See, John loved Jesus. Because he loved Jesus, he was still around on Saturday. You can't drop out who loves him and still claim he was going to work it for good. You've got to love him. Keep loving him no matter what's happening in your life. You don't back off. You know, you don't go from raising your hands to this high and say, okay, God, no, you've disappointed me, so it's only going to go this high now. You're singing volume. Well, God, I used to sing loud, but no, it's just going to be a little bit less now. God, I used to serve passionately in the church. Yeah, I'm going to serve, but it's just going to be at a far lesser level because, God, you've let me down. You've disappointed. I know I've still got to do bits and pieces, and I will, but, God, it's not going to be like what it used to be. No, friends. On Saturday, can I say love Jesus more? For everything in on Saturday. Because the more you love him in some ways, that's the way forward. That's, That's the answer, friends. So no matter how deep your struggle is today, I would say, sing louder. Lift your hands higher. Serve more. Give more generously. Love Jesus more than ever. Read your Bible more. Pray more. Just more. Everyone say more. More. On Saturday, more for Jesus. And you're going to see the triumph. You're going to see the victory. Somewhere along the line, somehow, someway, it's going to come. And God will use what you've been through to do something wonderful in your life. Job, listen to this, Job lost everything, all right? Now, probably none of us have had it as bad as Job. Lost his family, lost his possession. He lost his health. Like he had boils all over the face. And he just to scrape the boils off his body. Then he had his comforters, his friends who just really ripped into him. I mean, they were useless. And so, I mean, everything bad you could imagine. Now, imagine if Job had said, God, if you're going to treat me like this, I'm out. I'm gone. I'm not going to love you. I'm not going to follow you. I'm not going to serve you. And we know at the end of Job's life, it's hard to believe, isn't it? He got twice as much yeah. of beautiful daughters, beautiful sons, possessions, everything. He got twice as much as he had. I mean, I read the end of that chapter. And I think, can that be? Like, I mean, he had so much to start with, lost it all, ends up with twice as much. Imagine if he had never hung around on Saturday. He would have missed out on twice as much. What a tragedy. And what about Joseph? 
We all identify with Joseph, don't we? So Joseph, he's thrown in a pit by his brother to be left to die. That must have been as frightening as anything. Then he's falsely accused by part of his wife, ends up in a prison, languishing away. Imagine if Joseph said, okay, God, if that's the deal, it's my Saturday, I'm out of here. I will not follow you and serve you anymore. It's just too hard, it's unfair, it makes no sense. If he had done that, he ends up the prime minister of the most powerful nation, virtually the prime minister of the most powerful nation on the planet, Egypt. He, if he had walked away and said that, he would have missed his destiny. <sighs> wow. I mean, my life is all about destiny. <laughs> to me, the greatest loss would be to miss my destiny. And Joseph could have lost the purpose for which God put him on the planet. He could have missed the divine high calling of God on his life because he couldn't hang around on Saturday. Friends, do not leave Jesus on Saturday. He has got a great plan for your life. You are destined for fruitfulness. Every single one of us is. It may not look like mine, but it's going to look like something. It's going to be a fruitful life. There's seeds of greatness in you that are going to bear tremendous fruit. There's a, a wonderful calling, a wonderful future, a wonderful destiny upon your life, friends. Don't throw it away because of Saturday. Every one of us is going to face Saturdays. I want you right now to make a decision. Do you know our life is based on decisions? Is that right? You know, some people start university, they say, whatever happens, I'm going to finish, and they do. Some kind of think, well, I'll give it my best shot. Reading a book. Some says, I'm going to finish the book. <laughs> Others say, I may or may not. You know? Some say, I'm, I'm going to always serve in church, no matter what happens. And it's a decision is made, they'll always serve in church. It's a decision of the heart. Our life is based on decisions. All right? Because it's the decision of the world. I want you to make, if you can, by the grace, make a decision today and say to yourself, Jesus, with your help, on Saturday of my life, I will not desert you, and I will not leave you. In other words, I will not backslide. I will not stop attending church. Can you make that decision? Why don't you tell the person next to you, I think you should make that decision. Come on, tell them nice and loud. Come on, shout it at them, because some of them need to hear it. It's all about decisions, folks. It's all about decisions. Many of you remember the Columbine disaster. Tragedy, when many young people, including Rachel Scott, lost their lives as they were shot by two students. Rachel wanted to be a missionary. She's dead, age 16 or whatever it was. You'd think, well, that never happened. Hold on. She fulfilled her calling. Because on the day of her funeral, thousands of people gave their hearts to Jesus Christ as they watched three hours of CNN uninterrupted as the gospel was preached to the entire world. 25,000 cards came into those whose lives had been changed by the, future, by the funeral. God turned a tragedy into a magnificent triumph, and thousands of young people have been served, are stirred to serve God with greater passion than ever before. Yeah. And you might say, yeah, but hold on a minute. She died at the age of 16. Friends, life, your life, whether you live to 16 or 106, your life is a whisper. Yeah. It's a blip. It's a moment. It's a second. It's a breath. Before you know it, I'm telling you, it's gone. It is gone. Friends, the difference between 16 and 106 is nothing in the eyes of God. So don't worry about the fact that she died at an early age, friends. The truth is here, God turned a tragedy into a triumph. That's the message of the resurrection. Death could not hold Jesus down. Death could not hold Rachel down because the seed went into the ground and died and bore magnificent fruit. And that's the destiny on your life as well, and on my life as well. Three weeks before she died, Rachel Scott, I just love this, she stopped to help a young man change a fat tire in a rainstorm. Now, rainstorm, I'd probably just <laughs> look the other way, didn't see, I don't know about you. <clears throat> God will change me, don't give up on me. Anyway, he came to the funeral, 
in front of 3,000 people, he walked down the aisle, knelt before a coffin, and he gave his life to Jesus. And he wrote on the cross, listen to this, Rachel, your act of kindness changed my life. It doesn't take a lot, friends, to reach people with the love of Jesus Christ. It doesn't take much to be a missionary. Even when it's Saturday, change someone's tire. Even when it's Saturday, bake a cake for me. I mean, for someone. (laughs) Even when it's Saturday, make that phone call. Even when it's Saturday, give that person $10 if they need it. Even when it's Saturday, visit that struggling person. Stay close to Jesus on Saturday. Because if you do, friends... He is the God of resurrection. And there is a resurrection. There is a miracle. And guess what? It's got your name on it. That's That's the message of Easter. (laughs) Amen? All right. Declaration time. God will turn my trial into a triumph. You ready for it? Let's stand. Three times. Give it everything we got. Musicians, drums are going to give us a roll. You give a clap and a cheer and thank God for your triumph. Thank God for your resurrection. Because I'm telling you, death cannot hold you down because it couldn't hold Jesus down. God will turn my trial into a triumph. Ready? Three times. Let's go. God will turn my trial into a triumph. God will turn my trial into into a triumph. God will turn my trial into a triumph. No, no rival. Yeah. yeah.